And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles together to John chapter 12. This morning we will look at verses 20 through 26, John 12, 20 through 26. Please give the appropriate attention to the reading of the Word of God. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So read the words of the living God. Our Father, we gather here today and we want to be men and women, boys and girls who will receive your honor. Father, this is a hard message from the lips of our Lord Jesus. Would you fill us with your spirit and help each of us wherever we are in our, in our walk with you, in our relationship with you. Grab us each individually with what we need to hear from this. Where we need to let go of our selfishness. And may the instruction of our Lord Release that from us and fill us with hope, the living hope that we just sang about, where we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we looked at what is traditionally called the triumphal entry. Remember that? Jesus comes to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, and the crowds rush out to greet him, and they sing the halal, the, the customary words from Isaiah or from uh, Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they got up their palm branches. They went and, and cut them off trees, and they began to wave them in honor of this king. And we call it the triumphal entry. But do you remember the? imagery that, that I tried to paint for you last week? Remember how ridiculous it looked? It would have looked in that day? Remember a donkey, a, a, a donkey, a foal is about this tall, not, not from the floor, but from the platform. It's, it's about this tall. And the imagery is of Jesus, a full-grown man, on this donkey's colt, having to lift up his knees to keep his toes from dragging on the ground, on a little baby donkey as these people are out waving their palm branches and shouting Hosanna. And I, I tried to get you to picture someone from afar watching this thinking, that's ridiculous. That, that, what's going on? That's absurd. Because if he's a great king and a great warrior, he should be on a great white horse or something that looks strong and majestic. But that's not the imagery that's portrayed there. So he comes into the city, and as we gather the, uh, the other accounts together, Jesus went to the temple and once again threw out the money changers. We saw that at the beginning of John's gospel, 
And then here we are a couple years later, and he does it again. And he's in the temple area, at least that's, that's what it seems most likely. And John tells us here that some Greeks showed up, and they wanted to see him. Greek there is in contrast to Jews, Gentiles. It's another word for Gentiles. There were the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Jews called the Gentiles Greeks sometimes. And so these, these Greek speakers came to the Passover. So these were people who honored in some way the God of the Bible, the Jewish God, and they were there to celebrate Passover, and they wanted to talk to Jesus. They wanted to see him. Now, again, we're not told exactly how this played out, but it makes sense that Jesus uh, had made his way into the temple at this point, and the, the Greeks could only go so far in the temple. If you know your Jewish history, you know that there was an outer court, the, the court of the Gentiles, and there was quite literally a wall that prevented the Gentiles from getting any closer. They were, they were forbidden to go into the court of the Jews, and certainly forbidden from going into the holy place or the holy of holies. There was a barrier between them and God. That wall that kept the Gentiles only so close is what Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 2 when he said Jesus broke down that wall. He abolished that barrier between Jews and Gentiles, and now we all have access to God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? There is no longer distinction in God's mind between Jew and Greek or any ethnicity. The, there are only two groups of people now, and it's not based on where you came from. You are either in Christ or you're out of Christ. That's it. And all of us who are in Christ, as we, as we see in Revelation 7, someday from every tribe, tongue, and nation, there are going to be people, every ethnicity, gathered around the throne praising Jesus Christ and singing to him because God has destroyed that separation of men. But the Greeks were pre-cross, and so they didn't have access to God. Imagine that. Think of that symbolism. There in the middle of the Jewish camp is the throne of God, the presence of God in the inner sanctum of the Holy of Holies, and the Greeks couldn't get access. Well, for that matter, the Jews couldn't either, right? Except for one Jew, one time a year, the high priest, he was allowed to go in. The rest of the year, the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was like a giant warning, keep out on pain of death. Because if the Jew went into the holy of holies, God would strike him down. And if the Gentiles went past their wall, they would suffer the punishment of the people. On this side of the cross, beloved, all of that's been removed. You and I have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. You don't need to go through a Jewish people. You don't need to go through a priest. You don't need to go through a pastor or an elder or music. We have direct access to God 24-7 because Jesus has broken down all the barriers. But I'm getting ahead of the story. The Greeks weren't there yet, and the Jews weren't there yet either. And the Greeks show up, and they say to Philip, who apparently they had figured out Philip was, was someone close to, to Jesus, and, and if Jesus is in the inner court area, the, the J Jewish court, maybe Philip's hanging around, and they find him and say, hey, we know you know Jesus. We want to talk to him. We want to see him. How wonderful is that? When's the last time somebody walked up to you and said, I want to see Jesus? Has anybody ever said that to you? Wouldn't it be great if somebody showed up and said, hey, hey, do you know Jesus? Can you tell me about him? Can you introduce him to me? Can you take me to see him? Now, of course, the Greeks wanted to see Jesus because they had heard all of the stories, the testimonies of all the amazing things Jesus had been doing. He has healed lame people. He has healed a blind man. He has fed thousands with a, a few loaves and fishes. He's turned water into wine. And then the big one, just recently in our story, the big one, he raised a man from the dead. And they'd heard all of this, and they showed up and said, we want to see Jesus. 
So why is nobody coming to you and me and saying, hey, I want to see Jesus? Well, we don't have those miracles abounding among us. There's no guy walking around doing that. I mean, somebody shows up and starts clearing out the, uh, the graveyards, that's going to be an interesting time. I don't think that's going to happen. So what do we have to offer? What is it that we might display that would cause people to come ask us, where does this come from? We have the power of a transformed life. The Spirit of God is changing us and making us different from the world. We're going to see this later on in John. This is what distinguishes Jesus' disciples, our love for one another, our care and concern for each other. Not in a selfish way that, you know, kind of a tit for tat, I'll do this for you and you do something back for me, but a genuine, I don't care if I get anything back from you kind of love where we just care for one another. Or joy. We do not live among a people that exhibit a lot of joy. Everyone's depressed. Everyone's down and discouraged. It's this culture of outrage. Somebody's got to be mad about something, right? Just check your Twitter feed or Facebook. Somebody's outraged today about something. They're mad. And, and the constant refrain is, everything's awful. If only this person would get in power, this group would get, in, get elected. If only this thing would happen, then we can be happy. You know, we Christians can stand out in that crowd of being people filled with joy, peace, patience, husbands and wives loving one another. That's quite a contrast from what the world sees. Children obeying their parents, huge contrast from the world, right? Parents, amen? Parents loving their children, teaching them to obey. Not exasperating them, but encouraging them to follow the Lord. Relationships with people at work, coworkers, neighbors, not being self-righteous, not seeking our own, but genuinely caring for others more than we care about ourselves. That is a stark contrast from the world of unbelief. The more we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit the more likely people will notice and come to us and say, I don't know what makes you tick, man, but I'd love to hear more about it. That's sort of a way of saying, I want to see Jesus. Or at least that's how you should interpret it and take them to Jesus when they ask that. But again, that's ahead of the story. In this story, the Greeks have heard all the miraculous things that Jesus has done. They come to Philip and say, Philip, we want to see Jesus. We want to see this man who's done all these things. We want to see this man who was paraded through the city streets just, the, just recently. What does Philip do? Hey, uh, Andy, they want to see Jesus. What should we do? Uh, maybe we should go get Jesus. <laughs> so they go tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, there are Greeks here who want to see you. And Jesus turns to them and says, come on in, guys. Oh, wait, no, you can't come in here. I'll come out to you. Greeks are here. This is wonderful. Gentiles are here. Wonderful. I've been telling my friends that I have sheep of another fold. I've been telling my friends that, that there's, there's others in the world that I need to save, right? That's what Jesus said. Any of your Bibles say that? It does? <laughs> Bob, you need a new Bible. Do you notice that Jesus doesn't address the Greeks at all? He doesn't even acknowledge the question. Does that bother some of you? Bother somebody like my wife. Wait, what did he say to them? Did he say anything to them? The question was, do you want to go see the Greeks? Jesus doesn't even acknowledge that. One wonders why John put that in there. Well, one reason, one possible reason is, this was sort of the, the trigger for the Passion Week that the Gentile seeking Jesus is a, a fulfillment that now the time has come. That's possible. It's also possible that John is, is contrasting this with the previous verse that we looked at last week, the end, verse 11, where if you remember the Pharisees, when they see the crowds worshiping Jesus, the Pharisees say, look, you all have failed. The whole world is going after him. 
Remember, the Pharisees wanted Jesus shut down. And they're saying, you have failed to shut him down. Everybody's going out there. Now, they did not mean the Gentile world. They meant all of the Jews. It's a hyperbolic statement. The whole world, every Jew is going after Jesus. And John is showing a contrast between that and the reality that, indeed, the whole world was going to come to Christ. Every people group, every ethnicity. That's probably why it's in there, but we're not, we're not told for sure. Either way, Jesus does not address the Gentiles, but he makes this statement. The hour has come. The hour has come. He has used this word hour multiple times through this book. John has drawn attention to the word the the hour over and over again. But Prior to this, every time the hour was mentioned, it was not yet here. Right? He's there uh, at the very beginning, and his mom comes to him and says, hey, Jesus, they've run out of wine for this wedding celebration. So, Jesus, do something. You remember Jesus' response? Woman, my hour has not yet come. It's not my time yet. And then, of course, you remember what Mary did. Hey, do whatever he tells you to do. He's going to do it. I'm his mom. He has to. <laughs> and he changed the water into wine. A little bit later, as he infuriates the Jews, they were going to seize him. But John tells us they did not because his hour had not yet come. A little bit later, similar thing. It says no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus himself said on a couple of occasions, the hour is coming, indicating it's not here yet. But now, Jesus says the hour has come. What hour? The hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is great news. Think of just that phrase, the Son of Man. Being glorified. Keep in your mind the visions of what they have just seen. Of Jesus coming in to all of their praise and Hosanna proclamations. And now Jesus says, my hour has come. Their expectations would have been high. This is buttressed by the fact, by the prediction of Daniel chapter 7. Whenever Jesus uses the, the, the title son of man... He is self-consciously referring back to the prophetic word spoken through Daniel and then some in Ezekiel. But this one is is especially in Daniel. So if you've read Daniel 7 recently, you may remember this. And even if you haven't read it recently, you may remember this because it's it's one of those things that kind of sticks with you. So Daniel has this vision. And he sees these strange creatures. And he wrote down his dream. I need to learn from that because I don't dream very often. And there are times when I think, oh, I wish I could remember that dream. And if I had written it down, I'd remember it, but didn't write it down. And so I have all these great dreams that are somewhere back in my psyche, I guess. Daniel wrote it down. And this was a pretty crazy dream. He sees these creatures, four of them. One of them is a lion-like thing with wings. One of them is a bear. One of them is a leopard kind of thing with wings. And there's another one that really the only way he can describe it is this massive, huge, great beast with large iron teeth and strange horns coming out. And he scratches his head and says, what in the world is this all about? As he writes it down. And thankfully, there's an angel there to interpret it for him. He says this. He says, I kept looking until thrones were set up. Think about that. Thrones. Kings sit on thrones. Judges and rulers sit on kings. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. We sang in the very first song, Immortal, Invisible. We sang about the Ancient of Days, taken right out of Daniel 7. This is God. This is a picture of God on his throne. So God walks in and he takes his seat on the throne. His vest, vesture was white like snow, like white snow. So he was, he was bright. Are you laughing at me? Yes, you are. His hair was like pure wool, 
It doesn't mean he was really old, but it was so white, it was like pure wool. It says his throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire and a a river of fire was flowing and coming out before him. Picture that in your mind. Here's this one that is so brilliant, so white, it's, it's, it's whiter than the sun, because the sun is not white, it's yellow, and, and this throne with flames all around has wheels, so it's a wheel throne, wheelchair, wheels are f- flaming fire, and then this river of fire coming out from it. This God sits on a throne of fire, and he's not consumed by it. You've seen it, some of you have seen enough sci-fi to kind of picture something like this. It's, it's pretty scary. If, if you were standing there, you'd be intimidated. Rightfully so. And there are thousands upon thousands attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. All these people worshiping him and in and, and his court, serving him as the king of all kings. It says, the court sat and the books were opened. This is some kind of a judgment day. Because he's sitting in court, the court is now in session, and he's going to judge somebody. That's what courts do when the books are opened. Daniel says, then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. So I didn't read that or refer to that part, but one of the horns, which represents kings, kings of the earth, uh, were speaking great and boastful things. And that horn is destroyed, but not entirely killed and, and so on. But for our purposes, it's, it's this next part that, that matters. Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. What Daniel sees, and he doesn't understand this yet, in fact, it says he's confused, he he has to get help from the the angel, but what he sees is what the one we now know as Jesus coming before God the Father on the clouds of heaven. And what does God do for the Son of Man? It says he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So imagine God on this flaming throne, Jesus, the Son of Man, coming up before him. It says to him, to the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples Nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel sees the coronation of Jesus Christ as King of all kings, Lord of all lords, all authority in heaven and earth given to him. And did you notice the words? Glory was given to him. So when Jesus says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, all of the Jews who had studied these things, which was most of them, would have have referred back to Daniel 9 and thought, this is the day. The King has come. We paraded him in. He's now going to take his throne and rule over all the nations of the earth. This is a good day. What we've been waiting for all of our lives. And here's what we expect Jesus to do do next. Anybody have a sword I can borrow? Where are the fighting men? We need to find a secret place that I can train up my army. Because we're going to drive those Romans out of Jerusalem completely. We're going to drive them out of Judea completely. And then I'm going to march down there to Rome, and I'm going to confront Caesar face to face and take him out and begin my worldwide rule. This is the day, his coronation. It's time. The hour has come. And what Jesus says next doesn't make any sense if that's the paradigm. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, 
it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That doesn't sound like a king. That doesn't sound like ruling over the whole world. That sounds like death. It's because that's what it is. Jesus said, I have not come to drive out the Romans from Jerusalem. I've come to die. He said, I can't bear fruit if I don't die. Thanksgiving is not too far away, a couple months or so. I like pumpkin pie. Anybody like pumpkin pie? If you're going to have pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving, you can't take pumpkin seeds and put them on a counter and leave them there because those pumpkin seeds don't ever turn into other pumpkins, right? But if you put it in the dirt and bury it, then you can have pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving. It does no good unless it's put in, put in the ground. Jesus is in an agricultural context and he uses a very common illustration. I am going to die. And only if I die can I bear fruit. Think that through. What if Jesus had established his kingdom, his Jewish kingdom right there, his, if he'd raised up soldiers? and call all the citizens to obey him and worship him and serve him, and here we go, we're going to drive out the Romans and such. Think about this. His entire kingdom would have been made up of cosmic rebels. Every member of his kingdom has already rebelled against God Most High. Everyone, without exception. And even those who for the time would be loyal to him has still offended the Most High God with their sin and disobedience. So the best that Jesus could have is an entire kingdom of people who are enemies of God. Because they're sinners. There's no fruit there. There's no everlasting kingdom there because God has to judge every single person in his kingdom in that scenario. Not a very good kingdom. It's a kingdom of one, because he's the only one that had done the will of the Father. Jesus says, No, in order for me to bear fruit, to have a kingdom that will last, I have to die. But if I die, then I will, I will bear fruit. Every Christian in this room this morning is that fruit. Every one of us is the result of Jesus dying to build his kingdom. But this kingdom comes at a cost for all of us. Verse 25 is a shorter version of what we get in some of the other gospels. It's one of those handful of verses that are so sobering and penetrating, it makes us all a little bit uncomfortable. Verse 25, Jesus says, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Those are heavy words. Jesus says, if you're going to be in my kingdom, if you're going to be the fruit that I bear, it's going to cost you everything. You don't just come to church and say the words, I'm a follower. You don't just get wet in the baptistry. You don't just pray the sinner's prayer and you're in no matter what. Jesus says, if your mindset that is played out in your behavior is that the world is all about you, if you love your life, it will cost you everything. You will lose that life. Because if you're going to follow me, he says, you have to have a complete change of heart and mind where you say, 
I hate my life. If you do, you will keep your life forever. Now, what does he mean by hate your life? He doesn't mean like beat yourself up, you know, get out the whips and chains and start flagellating yourself every time you do something wrong. He means the world is not about you. Your mindset says this world does not exist for me. Astronomy lesson, here's the center of the universe. Who is it not? And you. I heard you all say you. It's not me. It is not you either. None of us are the center of the universe. Jesus is the center of the universe. If we live our lives consumed with our preferences, thinking about how people are treating me, what they're doing for me, what they're doing to me, and our lives are wrapped up in fulfilling our desires, meeting our needs, Jesus says that person loses his life eternally. And oh, are we among a people that is constantly telling us it's all about you? You, you, you. You do you. That's the phrase of the day, right? You do you. Hey, man, to each his own. Whatever you want to do, that's great. It's okay. Live for yourself. You only get to go around this thing one time and get all the goods you can. If somebody treats you poorly, you take them out. Because it's all about you. Jesus says, that kind of person isn't in my kingdom. The kind of person that's going to live with me forever says, I am continually trying to not make it about me and make it about Jesus and about others. The person who rejects their own life and says, it's not about me. It's about him. That person, Jesus says, as life everlasting. It's worthwhile to pause for a moment and check our own hearts and ask the Lord to reveal to us if there are still things in there that we say, this is all about me. I made my marriage all about me, made my family all about me, my career, my job, my hobbies, my relationships, Whatever, I've made it about me. Jesus says, uh-uh. As someone has said, there is not one square inch in the entire universe that Jesus does not say, that's mine. That includes our heart, our preferences, our wishes, our pursuits, everything. And if we do that, he says, then we belong to him. And we'll have eternal life. It says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where is he going? This is at the beginning of Passion Week, right? By the end of the week, Jesus is on the cross, dead. Jesus says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. We all have a date with the cross. Remember what he said? Take up your cross and follow me? Now, we're not going to hang on a, a literal cross, and we certainly cannot atone for anyone else's sins. But the path that for Jesus led to glory and for enthronement at the right hand of God, the path that led there was through pain and suffering and death. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to go where I go. You're going to experience pain and suffering. People are going to treat you poorly. That is the truth. The moment you think everybody's going to love you and think of you ahead of themselves, you're in for a world of hurt. Because that's not the people we live among. I mean, hopefully it is 
in your household. But that's not how the world thinks. The world hates us. Jesus is going to go on and say that very clearly in the upcoming passages. We have to stand firm and follow him no matter what comes if we're going to go through the path of pain to glory. That's what he said. Deny ourselves and live for him. And if we do that, he says, if anyone serves me, and I love this phrase, the Father will honor him. Does that strike you as odd? Everything else in the Bible says we honor the Father. Here Jesus says the Father will honor you. As most of you know, my father, my earthly father, passed away in January. And I will never forget the first time that my dad called me. And this is this is just in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. He was a, a pastor in St. Louis. And uh, obviously, I'm a pastor in Colorado Springs. And he called me, and he asked my advice on a church issue. I couldn't answer him for like 30 seconds. But what? My dad wants my advice? I don't remember that ever happening before in my life. Maybe it's because he never thought I was worthy of asking my advice. I think it, I had just gotten to a place in my ministry that he respected what I was doing, and he genuinely thought maybe I could provide the answer he was looking for. It, at a personal level, my dad honoring me enough to say, hey, I want your input on this. Not just your input. He'd, he'd ask for input. I want your advice. He used those words. What would you do, son? Wow. And he was very, uh, very often when he introduced me and my family, very much, uh, there was just pride in his voice when we'd show up and he'd say, and this is my son. I want you to meet my son. Now, I know some of you have a relationship with your father such that you've never heard that. And that's not good. The way God designed this was you were all supposed to have the same experience that I did. But you haven't. But you can and will all have an even greater experience than I did. For God, your heavenly Father, to say, I honor you, my son, my child. If we will follow Jesus to the end, we will be glorified with him, and he will be proud of us. He'll be pleased with us. He will somehow express honor. For us, for you. Can you imagine the most high guy, God saying something? The most high guy, it's a little too casual. The most high God making a statement of honor about you. That's going to be a good day. That's going to be a very, very good day. This is the first Sunday of the month. It means it's the Sunday when we remember specifically the death of Jesus on our behalf. Now, we've been talking about his death, but I want to draw your attention back to verse 25 in preparation for receiving the Lord's Supper. He says there, he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. And I applied it to you and me because that's what it applies to. That's who it applies to. But you realize the first one to lose his life and receive eternal life was Jesus Christ. Jesus, the scripture said, did not think of equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he humbled himself, became one of us, to serve us even to the point of death on a cross. 
We have seen this over and over in the Gospel of John. How many times has Jesus said, I am not here to do my will. This is not about me. I have not come to get what I want. I have come to do the Father's will and the Father's will alone. He hated his earthly life in that sense. And he was raised to live forever in glory. The first one who set the example for all of us. And he did it by going to the cross. As we're going to see in the upcoming passages, he knew full well what was going on. He had all the power and the authority in the universe to stop the madness and prevent his death. He said, no, no, I'm going until it's finished because I'm here to serve the Father and the Father wants me to go to the cross. Beloved, that's the example for us. As we pass out the elements for communion, I want you to hold them together. We're gonna take them together. If you are not a Christian here this morning, I'm glad you're here, but this is not for you, this is for believers. And as the elements are being passed, we're not gonna have any music, we're not gonna have any songs, any words to fill your head. I want you just to think that your Savior loved you enough He loved you enough to give up everything, to die on the cross so that we could be reconciled to the Father and be in his kingdom. That's how much he loves you.